Okay, so the first thing I want to start off by talking with you about is just a little bit about the structure of a Bunsen burner and how it works, and also the striker and how that works. So the Bunsen burner essentially is, is three majorly important parts. This down here is the gas valve. This up here rotates, and this is the air intake inlets. And then this right here connects to your um, gas line, and that is your fuel source, okay? So we connect this to a gas line. The gas pumps in, okay? We can adjust, to a certain extent, the amount of gas that flows into the Bunsen burner by twisting this knob at the bottom. However, most of the time we don't need to adjust this because um, it's easier to adjust the gas from the, the valve rather than from um, the Bunsen burner itself. What really needs adjusting on the Bunsen burner is the air inlets. So if you look right here on the Bunsen burner, I'll kind of pull it up real close. You can kind of see how there's these little holes right here. And the more that I screw this down, the smaller and smaller those holes become, okay? The more I unscrew, the bigger and bigger those holes are. So remember that in order for combustion to take place, in order for there to be fire, we have to have oxygen. But we do need to have oxygen in sort of the right amount, especially if we want to produce a decently hot flame, okay? So a flame that has too much oxygen is gonna be kind of an orangish yellow color, all right? The flame that we are trying to get is a blue flame with, that has like a, a blue inner cone, okay? And that's the perfect temperature for our Bunsen burner to work at. So when you set up your Bunsen burner, what you're mostly going to want to have to adjust is this air intake valve by rotating it, okay? And you want to adjust it until you have um, blue flame where you have a center cone. Um, and that center cone, of course, as you remember from our safety video, is the hottest part of the flame. Now, before I do any work with my Bunsen burner, it's very important that I check my hose to make sure that there aren't any cracks or holes in the hose. These holes are made out of rubber, and guys, rubber just cracks over time. Um, and so it's really important to check for that because the gas is flammable. And if the gas starts leaking out of a hole in the, in the tubing, um, it can actually be ignited by the flame over here, and you can actually end up with, with um, a fire that goes all the way down the rubber tubing. Have seen before. It does happen. So we always want to check and make sure that our gas is flowing through a tube with no holes in it. The other thing I wanted to show you how to use is the striker. So the striker actually has a little piece on it that we can change out. This little piece right here is called the flint. Okay, and this is largely made out of the lanthanide series of metals. They're that first row of metals down below the periodic table. So you know you have those two funny rows that are down below the periodic table? Um, the first row is the lanthanide series, and flint like this is made largely of those lanthanide elements. And when this is struck against a rough surface, it will make a spark, okay? And the flint just screws onto the end of the striker like that. Very easy. And then we put it into the little cap. And the little cap has this striking file almost. It's a very rough surface. It's very um, scratchy. And so it's going to create the friction needed for the flint to make a spark. Now, when you're trying to light your Bunsen burner, you need a really good spark. So these little tiny ones are probably not enough to light it, okay? So when you do your Bunsen burner and you're trying to light the striker, you wanna push down with your thumb into the striker so you get a nice, solid spark. None of these little baby sparks, you want a really good spark. And you're gonna to have to hold it right over the gas, like this, okay? Now, it's a little scary when it first lights because you kinda of feel the whoop um, come back at your hands but no one gets burned that way, okay? So as soon as you light it, you just move the striker out of the way, all right? So I'm gonna demonstrate how to light it. Okay, guys, so when you go to light this, you wanna make sure that your, your tubing is pushed really, really completely into this gas valve here. And I wanna to stress to you that this is a two-person job, okay? You want one person back here controlling the gas while the other person is over here using the flint and the striker to light it, okay? I'm gonna have to do this by my lonesome, but 
you guys, when you do this in class, you're going to have two people, one person on the gas, one person on the striker. Now, the gas valve, you kind of want to be a little careful with it. If you have it on too high, your Bunsen burner will light, but then it will blow itself right back out, okay? Because the gas is just moving too fast um, and, it's, and it's not going to be able to continue to combust. If it's not on high enough, then it won't light because there isn't enough flammable fuel in order for it to light, okay? Sorry, I gave you a kick. All right, so I'm gonna light this one. Okay, now you can hear that this is very, very high. So I'm gonna actually bump my gas down just a little tiny bit. And I'm gonna let just a little less air in because I think I've got just a little too much air going. And there. Look at that perfect, perfect flame. I've got an outer flame and then I've got my inner blue cone. That tip of that inner blue cone is gonna be my hottest point in the flame, all right? So once your Bunsen burner is lit, you wanna make sure that you don't walk away from it or leave it unattended. So you wanna make sure before you light your Bunsen burner that you have everything all assembled. Now, should anything go wrong with your Bunsen burner at any point, the first thing you always wanna do is turn off the gas. And remember, you're gonna push the valve away from you. All right, so to turn off the gas, you push the valve away from you. And of course, when you're done with your lab, you're going to push the valve away to, from you to turn the gas off so that we're done. Now, remember, we just had fire here, so you don't wanna to touch that, because it's metal, and there was just fire there, and so we don't wanna burn ourselves on it. So we're gonna leave it set up like that. Okay, so to do the flame tests, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little test tube of clean water and I'm going to stick my inoculating loop into the water and just get it wet. The inoculating loop, it's kind of hard to see because it's really, really dark, is just a little loop of metal. Okay, so I'm going to stick that into my water first. The first one I'm going to do is sodium. I'm going to get it wet and then I'm going to stick that into my sodium salt. This here is sodium nitrate. Okay, then I'm gonna hold it into the flame and we're gonna observe the color. So sodium is that nice, pretty orange color. So go ahead and record your observations in your data table. Now, really important, I wanna make sure to use a clean inoculating loop and clean water for the next one because I don't want to contaminate my different um, my different salts. So I'm going to get a clean inoculating loop and I'm going to dip it in some clean water. This one is going to be potassium, potassium nitrate. I'm going to dip it into my potassium nitrate salt, get my inoculating loop with some potassium nitrate on it. Now you still see a little bit of the orange but really the color here is that light purple you're seeing. There's a nice light purple with potassium. The color, we call that lavender. I'll do that one one more time since that one's a little hard to see. The orange is a little overpowering. The orange is just the metal of the inoculating loop. But if you look that pretty purple color in the background, that light, light purple color, that is the potassium. All right. The next one I'm going to do is lithium. And again, clean inoculating loop, clean water. I wanna use clean, clean, clean for everything. So I'm gonna dip my inoculating loop into the clean water, and then I'm gonna dip it into my lithium nitrate salt. And I'm gonna hold it in here. Lithium, you see, is that pretty bright red. It's a nice solid red color. All right, the next one, I'm gonna get a clean inoculating loop again and a clean thing of water. And this time I'm gonna do copper. This metal is copper nitrate. Okay, so I'm gonna dip my inoculating loop into the salt. Copper's fun. We use copper in a lot of um, TV movies because it burns 
that nice green. So when they want to make like a witch's potion or whatever, they'll often use copper. Okay. Again, clean water, clean inoculating loop as I switch to my next one. The next one I have is a strontium nitrate. So I'm going to dip my clean inoculating loop into the clean water and I'm going to dip it into my strontium nitrate salt. There we go. This is also red, but a much lighter red than, um, than the lithium was. And then my very last one, one more time, clean water, clean inoculating loop. I'm going to dip my inoculating loop into my water. And the last one I'm going to do is calcium. So I'm going to dip my inoculating loop into my calcium nitrate salts. So this one is also kind of an orange color. It's a little bit lighter. Oop, there's a little bit of copper on there. All right, let's do that one one more time. So our calcium, also kind of an orangish color, but with a little bit more red than the sodium.